Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajesh Chokhani, a general pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai and today in this series of Lest We Forget, we will be revising our concepts about weight and height. So the title for today's session is Mind Your Weight and Height. Uh, friends, weight is something which we are all focused on a lot. Parents often bring their children to us because they think their child is not putting on enough weight and adults often come to doctors because they are putting on too much weight. So when children are brought for so-called poor weight, the first step is to confirm whether the weight is genuinely low or it is only the parent's perception by plotting the child's weight on an age-appropriate growth chart. In children, weight depends on a lot of factors including genetics, gestation, birth weight, etc. So a prematurely born baby will continue to have low weight till this child catches up at approximately 2 years of age. Also, nutrition is the key determinant of growth in the intrauterine period and in infancy and then after that in childhood growth hormone and thyroxine have a major influence and then the sex steroids in puberty. So, an intrauterine growth retarded baby, IUGR baby will have a low weight and height and depending on when they started during pregnancy this baby may or may not adequately catch up in the postnatal period. On another note, many such low birth weight babies are often force fed or overfed in an attempt to increase their weight. This puts them at risk for obesity and metabolic syndrome later in life. Now, in general, a single weight reading is by itself is not good enough to judge the health of a subject, we must always take this in conjunction with the energy level and the vitality of the subject. So if a child's or for that matter even an adult's so called poor weight has been poor all along but the patient has been active, energetic or playful and asymptomatic then it just means that this is a constitutionally thin child or adult with normal health. On the other hand, if a child or an adult uh, is symptomatic or unwell with poor weight or has documented weight loss, then he or she definitely needs to be evaluated. Children are growing and therefore are expected to put on weight at a steady pace regularly. On the other hand, adults have completed their growth and are expected to maintain their weight in a very narrow range of plus minus 1 kg. Minor weight loss during the illness is temporary across all ages and is quickly regained following recovery. But significant weight loss, even if it is without any symptoms, definitely needs an evaluation for a hidden disease which could be in the form of chronic infection, chronic organ dysfunction or even a malignancy. The only exception to this is an adult who is intentionally losing weight because he or she is obese. In infants, not gaining weight could have the same significance as losing weight. Of course, we will have to look into the duration over which this is happening and the general well-being or otherwise of the infant. Inadequate nutrition is the commonest cause of poor weight in infancy. Often, we get children also whose weight is stagnating, but they are otherwise very active and are growing in height as per expectation. So this is normal and it once again reinforces the fact that height is a better measure of health than weight because weight is affected by many other factors. What about obese or overweight? The prevalence is increasing tremendously across all sections of society including the lower socio-economic strata. Uh, diagnosis is by BMI that is body mass index. So in an Asian adult, a BMI of more than 23 is called overweight, more than 25 is called obese and in children, we use the 23rd and the 27th adult equivalents as cutoffs for overweight and obese. As a general rule clinically, a child who is tall and obese is primary obesity or exogenous or nutritional obesity and does not need any investigation for the cause. So we need to investigate children who are short and obese 
for either endocrinal or syndromic or monogenic obesity or drug related or other causes of obesity for this we need to be look on the lookout for clinical clues so for example early onset obesity suggests monogenic obesity hypertension may suggest cushing's looking for features like dysmorphic features or characteristic faces or developmental delay is part of or common to the clinical approach of obese children as well as short and tall children the dietary history history of inadequate physical activity and family behaviors will help us diagnose primary obesity in adults it is almost always a faulty lifestyle we must understand that obesity is a multi organ disease so it causes or contributes to hypertension diabetes strokes cardiac dysfunction fatty liver cholelithiasis pcos infertility osteoarthritis sleep apnea respiratory issues and even a low self esteem and therefore investigations are mainly directed towards the complications of obesity and only when we are thinking of secondary causes of obesity that the investigations are directed towards the cause of obesity treatment of primary obesity is in the form of correction of the dietary uh, dietary fault faulty diet and reinstating the correct lifestyle measures including exercise but and this has to be followed by the whole family but once obesity is established it is difficult to treat and therefore prevention is easier so in children we must always use growth charts and even adults should monitor their weight regularly so that at the earliest indication of a upward swing we get alerted and we should guide them accordingly to take appropriate steps what about short stature again the first step is to confirm whether the child is actually short by plotting his or her height on a growth chart appropriate for that age and population the clinical approach to short stature is to decide whether the child is sick looking or not sick looking a sick looking child with short stature suggests that he or she is suffering from a chronic organ dysfunction or chronic infection whereas in a non sick looking child we will be looking for endocrine causes syndromic causes skeletal dysplasias and of course genetic short stature and constitutional delay of growth and puberty so once again a good clinical examination to look for clues like dysmorphic features and others which we just discussed and in addition skeletal deformities and whether it is a short limbed versus short trunked short stature will help us narrow down the possibilities we spoke that a child who is obese is tall to begin with but his or her final height may be short because puberty sets in earlier so this tells us another important lesson that later the puberty taller is the height growth chart is the most important tool to evaluate short stature so in a non sick looking child if his or her growth curve is progressively falling below the lowest normal then it means we need to investigate them for endocrine causes but if a child's growth curve is below the lowest normal but it is running parallel to the printed curves then there are two possibilities if the parents of such a child are average in height and height then this is likely to be genetic or familial short stature and if one or both parents are tall then this is most likely to be constitutional delay of growth and puberty which can be confirmed by a similar history in one parent and of course by the bone age for bone age we need to take a x ray of the left hand of the subject and compare it with the atlases a uh, tall stature again needs to be confirmed by uh, looking at the patient's height being two standard deviations more than the appropriate for that age and population as per the growth chart again the clinical approach 
the first category is to look at if the child is absolutely normal in all other respects and if there is a history or rather if one of the parents or both the parents are very tall then this is likely to be genetic tall stature the second big category is syndromic so we look for clinical clues for example absence of secondary sexual characteristics and gynecomastia and Klinefelter syndrome or uh, increased arm span in Marfan syndrome or macrocephaly in Soto syndrome or uh, uh, hypertrophy in beckwith weidenman syndrome and so on and so forth. After genetic and syndromic, an uncommon third category of tall stature could be endocrinal. So examples are acromegaly or gigantism or exposure to excess sex steroids as happens in precocious puberty. So in these cases, these children are taller than their counterparts at that time. But of course, the final height will depend on many other factors, including whether treatment has been taken. So in all such cases, it is important to assess them for their pubertal status, whether it is normal, advanced or delayed. Tall stature has its own attendant problems, social and practical issues in daily life. And in addition, they may have medical issues like an increased predisposition to varicose veins, osteoarthritis, etc. In selected cases, treatment is possible in the form of using sex steroids or FT5CO diesis. So to summarize friends, when we are evaluating the height and weight of a subject, it is very important to look at trends rather than a single reading. And this has to be seen in conjunction with the clinical well-being or otherwise of the patient, presence of any physical signs and the growth chart. Such an approach will help us maintain excellence and rationality in our practices. Thank you. The next video will be by Dr. Amdekar sir on Don't Ignore Mental Health, which will be the last of this series of Lest We Forget. Thank you.